Hey, what is up guys? MKBHD here and tablets, tablets kind of had a weird year in 2015. We're all familiar with where tablets sit in between smartphones and computers, but lately as they try to differentiate themselves, they've blurred that whole line. Case and point. What do these three tablets from this year have in common? Two of them have the word pro in the name. They all kind of have this first party keyboard attachment, but really they all really want to be laptops. This is Google's Pixel C. The Pixel C is beautiful, not gonna lie. It's actually one of my favorite pieces of recent Google hardware, but it is the most awkward combo with its keyboard. So the tablet itself, by itself, it's an excellent build, completely unibody metal enclosure, has a chamfered edges, and a really solid feel in the hand, has some nice weight to it too. It's one of the smaller tablets, but it's solid. You've got the 10 inch 2560 by 1800 LCD up front, and these big stereo speakers on either side that get really loud for media or games or whatever you use it for. And even that dope always on color bar on the back that behaves the same way it does on the Chromebook Pixel. And inside it's all high end for a tablet. So it's rocking the Nvidia Tegra X1 chip and three gigabytes of RAM. Performance, while it's okay, it actually isn't the greatest thing in the world. It's fairly normal throughout, but sometimes apps take an extra second to open and there's animation stuttering more often than I expected. So it's not to the point where it's a problem or it's unusable or anything but I expected it to be corrected with software updates, and I certainly didn't expect it to have this problem out the box. Anyway, this is the keyboard dock. It has one of the more interesting magnetic attachment mechanisms. It's not really intuitive or like a normal laptop, but they're held together with magnets normally, and it kind of sort of looks like a normal laptop before we start to mess with it. To open it, what you have to do is slide them apart, then turn the tablet around and click the magnets into place, and then pull up on the hinge. Now these magnets are really strong, so once you get it open like this, you're solid. It's gripping that back panel with some force, and you can use it without worrying about it slipping. You can adjust the angle and everything, it works just fine. To put it back, you flatten the keyboard, and then slide it off, flip it over, and then place it face down. And from there, you're good to go. And there's actually an additional battery in the keyboard that's now wirelessly charging the tablet, so that is legit. Unfortunately, the downside is this is like the most awkward keyboard for any tablet. It almost seems pointless after you use the Pixel C for a while. I found myself looking on the keyboard for like a home button, a back button, a multitasking button, or even like any Android shortcut keys. There's none of that. The only Android specific button is just the Google search button. This is basically just the keyboard, the letters themselves. For literally, if you need to type out a lot of text, and I can't think of many people who type that much on their tablet to justify spending 150 bucks on an accessory like this. There's this really great article, I'll link it right below that like button, by Ron Amadeo on Ars Technica on how this tablet, the Pixel C, was probably never meant to run Android, and it was designed as a Chrome OS tablet, and then at the last minute, plans left us with this. Now, Android isn't bad on tablets, but it obviously still has its quirks, Plenty of apps are still portrait only, and plenty just don't measure up to the more functional desktop or even specifically iPad apps. So Pixel C kind of falls short of its potential. It's a bunch of awesome hardware, but it just doesn't quite fill the shoes I imagined it to. What's fun though is even if you just get it as an Android tablet and never use the keyboard, you still get the side benefit of being filled with a whole lot of strong magnets. Enough to stick it to a refrigerator. Boom, there's your smart fridge. Now here we have the iPad Pro. This is the most well-known of the bunch, and it's partially due to the huge popularity of the other iPads that came before this one. And iPad Pro, as we already know, is huge. We've talked about it. It has a big, beautiful 12.9 inch, 2.7K display. And again, an all metal jacket, just obscenely fast performance throughout. We already know the A9X is legit. So it's like the ideal candidate to replace a laptop, if any, right? It also happens to have the best tablet only battery life of any of the three but touch is the primary interaction on an iPad, for sure. There are tons and tons of iPad-specific apps in that app store, and of course, they're pretty much all made for using it with your hands. So all your games, your productivity, everything with the iPad Pro is by default kind of done with your hands on the display. Now, I do have your first-party accessories. You kind of can't forget to mention the Apple Pencil, which, in all honesty, is objectively actually a pretty good stylus. People usually don't need a stylus, but for those who do use one, this is your best option for the iPad Pro in terms of performance and low latency. I just kind of wish it had an eraser, and I also wish it didn't charge like a giant lollipop. But all that being said, the keyboard accessory is yet again the one that shows how much iPad Pro wants to compete with laptops. It gets a little closer to a normal laptop experience, so the keys themselves don't have a lot of travel or click, but they're kind of like the 12-inch MacBook. But there's some useful stuff. So there's a command button on either side, an option button, a control button, and they all work kind of how you'd expect them on a laptop running OS X. So Command-T in the browser opens a new tab, 
command and space from anywhere open search like on a Mac. So I can say that this one's intuitive. You're still gonna get handsy with an iPad Pro though. So the keyboard case for 170 bucks offers a tiny bit of extra functionality, but again, you're definitely not fully replacing a laptop. Now, lastly, here we have Microsoft Surface Pro 4. This tablet is the closest to a laptop of any of them. It has a 12.3 inch, 2.7K display, full metal body again, with a little bit more of an industrial look and feel, a little more weight. It has fans and vents for cooling, and you can spec it up to full on laptop internals. You can give it a terabyte SSD, you can go Core i5 or Core i7, and you can go up to 16 gigs of RAM and give it Intel Iris graphics. It has a full-size USB port, full-size SD card slot, and full Windows 10. So full desktop apps, the Microsoft Office suite, the whole deal. So almost anything you can do on any other Windows 10 laptop, you can do on Surface Pro 4. So on top of that software experience, the keyboard attachment for Surface Pro 4 is also by far the best of the bunch, to the point where it's really part of buying a Surface Pro. You really shouldn't get one without the keyboard. The travel and clickiness of the keys is most like a normal laptop. It feels like regular typing. It even has backlighting. And the hinge mechanism on the Surface itself keeps it at pretty much whatever angle you want, which makes it pretty great for, again, normal work you do on a normal laptop. And the real kicker is this keyboard has a touchpad with a mechanical click and gestures and everything. So you don't actually need to touch the display on the Surface Pro 4 for much of anything of what you're doing. So this guy is so well geared as a laptop with the keyboard and the trackpad that it actually kind of struggles as a tablet. It's sort of the opposite of the iPad Pro experience. Now all the full Windows apps are built for being used with a mouse and keyboard. Touch is secondary. Touch is awkward on the Surface Pro 4 and pretty much any convertible Windows tablet for that matter. So you'll get the most out of a Surface Pro 4 with that keyboard and trackpad for sure. So back to the three tablets. To simplify and sum it all up, you got Photoshop Express, Photoshop Fix, full Adobe Photoshop. You're rocking Android Video Editor or iMovie or Adobe Premiere and After Effects. Google Docs, iWork, or the full Microsoft Office suite. You kind of get the idea. They all really want to be laptops, but they're not quite there because they're not quite laptops for now anyway. Thank you for watching. And if you enjoyed, you might be interested in the other tech of the year roundups, which you can find made by people who you saw appear throughout this video. So Judner, your average consumer with his favorite headphones, John TLD with the best smartphones and Austin Evans with the best gaming tech of the year. Thanks for watching. And I'll talk to you guys in the next one. Peace.